we are myth vision welcome back to myth vision podcast i'm your host derek lambert ladies and gentlemen we're gonna be crucifying the bible today and with that being said my guest is deborah grace the author of the book crucifying the bible welcome to myth vision thank you i'm happy to be here yeah, I'm glad you are too. And seems like we have similar journeys in many ways. And you actually wrote a book on uh, exposing oil and water. And what I mean by that is, is like how the Bible really does not uh, make sense. It does not connect on so many levels. We'll get into a lot of these today. At first, I'd like to ask, first of all, your book. Can you tell us a little bit about this book briefly uh, while I have it here popped up on the screen? Let us know what, yeah. something about it. <laughs> so my husband was the one that came up with the title. So I have to give him credit for that. <laughs> it was brilliant. It's metal as heck. And it just kind of grabs you by the shirt and pulls right in. So it was, it was great that I had that ability to sort of catch people's attention and then share my journey. Um, so I, I went into a, a very long preface <laughs> Sorry about that, but it <laughs> kind of gives so much background into m my journey, my uh, walk, 41 years in religion, and then uh, finding the little cracks in the foundation, so to speak, that led me to say, wait a minute, wait a minute, so you, the Old Testament actually doesn't support the New Testament, and here's why, and I had been doing so much for uh, Christianity, I called myself an ambassador for Christ and, um, a, you know, the most godly woman. I, that was my mission. It, that was my identity, my whole identity. And then finding out um, all this information, I was like, mm -hmm. all my years of writing and all my years of research, let's not let it go to waste. Yeah, uh, and I'm glad I didn't throw any of that away or delete it. I just uh, and I didn't know why until I started writing the book, and so here we are. <laughs> yeah, and you also have it on Audible. So if you're not able to read mm -hmm. a paperback version, which you have recommended to me, highly recommended, I do get the paperback because there's a lot of charts and visuals for pe for people to kind of latch onto and to be able to see, especially when you're dealing with scriptures and you're trying to compare things. It's good mm -hmm. to see them side by side. So you do that. But if you're driving down the road or on a walk and exercising or the, you can get it on Audible and it's really an interesting book. I tell people like as you're deconverting, this might, you know, be something that like solidifies those questions. You may not have the answers for, but that's the point. Like it creates more problems than solutions in terms of biblical. This this leads me to the point of where I felt like I needed to uh, to get some other thing to fill my life up with and realize that the Bible wasn't going to be enough. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah. uh, Oh, go ahead. Oh, no, no, it's fine. I was just going to briefly for those who don't know, you know, I've got the Patreon help support us here. Tons and tons of videos endlessly that have not been released. Very few do get released to YouTube lately. I mean, I've got more back here for anyone who wants to help support us. I highly recommend doing so. So, Deborah, sorry about that. I just want to get people acquainted with ways in which they can get the book because I was listening to it on an airplane, on uh, airplane mode in the sky. Um, I can't remember where I was traveling from, but I'm listening to the book. And you go through a lot. It's mainly what I notice is comparing the, the Hebrew Bible with Jesus, with the New Testament. How, where do we begin in such a discussion? Because you go into so many things. Where would you like to start? Right. Um, so when I first found the the cracks in the journey, I was actually um, challenged by somebody on, on Facebook. They were ostracizing a series of videos by Scott Schub. Um, and he has a YouTube channel called Be It to Fill a Productions. And he has a, um, a series about the New Testament and the New Testament Messiah. Is, is he? And when I first listened to that video at work, um, I probably turned at 10 shades of white. 
and went home, told my husband, <laughs> um, I need you to see this video, but uh, if you don't see what I'm seeing, our whole marriage could be done. Because I knew, you know, you can't be unequally yoked. Or if you are, it's very challenging. Um, you know, I know people that make it work politically, but when you have such stark religious uh, beliefs, it's super challenging. Mm -hmm. um, and then I went into deep dive because I had to know without a shadow of doubt. Um, I'm a researcher just by nature and I just had to find out. So I went and when the, the first part of the series that, um, that Scott Shue went into talked about the sacrifices. And I went even more into that. No, he went into prophecies, sorry. And then I went into the sacrifices and I'm like, wait a minute, there are specific um, caveats. There are specific requirements for sin sacrifices and to violate every single one of them in the crucifixion is that's, that's huge. So the whole first section of my book is comparing and contrasting. It, it's juxtaposing the Old Testament next to the New Testament and finding out what, what actually makes sense, what doesn't make sense. And the New Testament is, <laughs> it turns out, almost entirely ad hoc rash, rationalization arguments and fallacies. Um, and so they don't match. They don't mesh. And when you, you don't have the, the prophecies fulfilled, you don't have the sin sacrifices right, you uh, made up things like baptism, um, you know, and then I went into the Old Testament and I'm finding there's 10 just in, in the Old Testament, not including the pseudepigrapha or the apocrypha. There's 10 other uh, forms of atonement that don't require blood. And so then I'm like, well, why was there a sacrifice at all then? You know, and then I'm looking at, you know, is Jesus God? And well, if he is God, then um, why not just forgive everybody like he did with Nineveh? Mm -hmm. You know, there's no point in in this sacrifice. And it just it when you put it all together and you look at everything that's there, it just looks like a book that's full of um witchcraft it's blood magic it's incantations it's um water magic it, it's uh curses um blessings that those are things that you find within um stereotypical uh witchcraft and so i'm just like wait a minute <laughs> So that that's it brings up a really good point. I mean, as a Christian, I never once thought like using these words, I never once thought me being baptized in water was magic. Never. Right. You'd never use right. that word. That word did right. not. That's a bad word. That's a no, no. That, I mean, unless you mean it like it's just a joke or a trick or like, yeah, you know, you're not really doing real magic. It's just it's just getting people to think you're doing an illusion or something. That, as a Christian, I didn't have a problem with people being magicians like that. But like people who thought they had real magic, that's a no-no. There's, mm -hmm. like, there's clear passages that I thought where it condemns this even to put them to death, you know, in the, right. in the Hebrew Bible. So I'm like, this is no. But the idea that something does magically happen, all right, mm -hmm. when you're baptized or when a, a sacrifice takes place, that's, that's pretty heavy stuff. It is. If you think about it, and I don't think Christians even think about, right? oh, I'm just being dunked underwater. I'm carrying on the tradition. They don't realize that this is magic. This is actual magic, but it's endorsed within their bubble. So they don't call it magic. They, this is just baptism and God's spirit comes down and this is all da 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 da. And it's like, no, like an outsider from another faith would call that magic. Just like you mm -hmm. would call that what they're doing magic. Right. Um, we could, there's, there's several really, really strong examples. Uh, for instance, when God sends an evil spirit to Saul, 
he's basically possessing Saul. When right. you have the magic uh, temple dust water that is supposed to cause an abortion for uh, you know a woman who's cheating, um, that's earth magic. Uh, when you have the um, red heifer that is supposed to purify, uh, so the instructions are you take a, a heifer, a red heifer, and you burn it and you create ashes to include the dung. The poop of the cow is included in these ashes, and then you add running water to it, and you sprinkle these ashes, and that's supposed to purify. That sounds like a lot of witchcraft to me right there. Yeah. Yeah, we never really think like that. That's the thing. It's weird when you're in the bubble. So I, I got to take it back. What made you see this? Was it, was it listening to that podcast where he was like, this is magic? Is that what is that? Oh, no, what he you? didn't. He didn't. No, he didn't even touch on what did he that. say? All he, he was just talking about that the prop, the major prophecies in the Old Testament okay. don't line up to what you know the Messiah is. See, these prophecies are written as a litmus test to prove you are who you say you are. Yeah, we don't have those prophecies fulfilled in Jesus. He didn't. He didn't usher in world peace. He didn't usher in worldwide knowledge of God. He didn't rebuild the temple. In fact, he's talking about um, you tear this temple down, and in three days I'll raise it up again. And you know, according to the New Testament, that's talking about his body. Mm -hmm. But there's three chapters in the Old Testament with physical dimensions of the new temple. And he's saying this standing in an existing temple. Right. <laughs> so it's make, changing. That doesn't make sense. Yeah, it's clearly changing something. This is where this huge rubber hits the road thing for me on the inclusion of Gentiles and potentially cognitive dissonance on explaining why it didn't happen. But this has to be the Messiah. So like if you have to have him be the Messiah and he dies and how do we explain this? Well, we must not have understood it. Plus the idea that Hellenism plays a role, which I know I'm going a little outside the Bible, but the point is, is that there's this Greek philosophy yeah. that seems to start taking the kingdom from this earth to a platonic type realm or something else otherworldly. And that is not Hebrew. That is not biblical. If you get right. Old Testament biblical. So mm -hmm. they're doing something new for whatever the reasonings are, whether purposeful or ad hoc in some sense to try and justify what happened to my recently claimed Messiah, or I thought he was the Messiah. So now we have to make sense of everything. Um, I mean, make his, make his crucifixion a sacrifice. Uh, well, that doesn't quite add up with what we're reading here. So right. where did you get the magic stuff though? Where, like, where did that stuff start coming up in your mind? Thinking of every little ritual they do is really witchcraft or some form of magic. Um, <sighs> There's a couple of memes out there that that have talked about, you know, prayer is just meditation, you know, and and I went a little bit further and a little bit further as I as I was coming out of this journey. And, uh, you know, I have some friends who are into Wiccan and um, and I just was like, you know what, there's a lot more to the Bible that is all about magic. And, you know, it's it's not just the um, the little things either. Um, it's some of the big things. It's, you know, dark blood magic. The whole um, exodus with regard to the plagues um, that are poured out by God. And then you look at the bowls of wrath that are poured out in, the, in Revelation. And you're like, that's all witchcraft too. Hmm. There's so much. <laughs> yeah, I never really thought of it that way. So you, you, you're you starting to make me like pay attention to things I didn't really pay attention to when I read your book. It was it was like I had read these tons of times, but never really stopped, paid attention and thought about them like that. So that's why I highly recommend people get crucifying the Bible because you do that. And now you, you, I'm going to have the hard copy. So I'll be able to actually see the examples side by side. Um, getting back to the prophecies. Some of the things yeah. you mentioned in the book is the idea is that this isn't even what it's talking about. Like, it's clear, we, we've said many times on my show, that when you look at the references that are being referenced, that has mm -hmm. nothing to do with what the New Testament author is doing with this. It's 
It's like, no, that had nothing to do with a virgin birth, you know, or that had nothing to do. And you're referencing the Hebrew Bible showing, Mm -hmm. no, it's not talking about Jesus. Did, was that one of the big eye openers for you or? Um, yeah. So the further, uh, my journey progressed, the more I saw. And so when I I had to open up a, a fake Facebook account so that my, uh, 93 year old grandmother wouldn't have a heart attack. (laughs) (laughs) So while I'm doing that, I'm, I'm, I'm processing all this information and I'm having these online debates and somebody's like, well, what about Isaiah 53? And I'm like, let me look, hold on, I'll get back to you. And, um, and so, you know, throughout the whole book of Isaiah, you have so much there, you know, 714, it's talking about a virgin birth. But that whole prophecy is fulfilled in Isaiah 8, 13, right? So, and then it's the prophetess, right? So it talks about the prophetess Isaiah. Well, you don't get that name prophetess unless you have already consummated the relationship. So she wasn't a virgin. And then to, to make a double prophecy or a shadow prophecy, that's all made up terms that you know pastors use to try to make this ad hoc rationalization argument and then you go to isaiah 53 and it's like most of its past tense folks um you know verse 8 is using the hebrew word lamo which means them not him um you're talking about a backwards uh parallel that you know jesus was crucified with two criminals but isaiah 53 is talking about the death with the rich and then the burial with the criminals and jesus wasn't buried with criminals he was buried with rich so it's completely Uh, backwards yeah i was gonna say (laughs) what's interesting is he dies with thieves like why would rich people be thieves It, it doesn't make sense if if you see what i'm trying to get at here Oh, well, I had people try to, to, to make that claim. Well, rich the, people are thieves. <laughs> well, yeah, like, but that's kind of silly. The only way that they okay. have a justification is to argue that him being buried in Joseph of Arimathea's tomb is, and that's what the New Testament is actually trying to do. Is sure. saying, well, there's this rich yeah. guy, Joseph of Arimathea. It's like, dude, you literally died with two thieves. And then the fact that you had a rich guy named Joseph of Arimathea, that's a huge question mark. Did this guy even exist? What is it? Right. What's really going on here? Um, but that's so silly to like connect those little dots. There's far yeah. more problems than there are solutions to the New Testament doing this. So, oh yeah. Uh, then then you have um, like all of of chapters one through fifty two. They use uh, the suffering servant as all of Israel, and then from fifty four on to the end. It's all of Israel, but this one chapter in the middle is, oh, we're, we're going to change the meaning for this one chapter. Well, come on, people. That's like taking a truck ride in the middle of a marathon. It's cheating. Mm. It's part of your ad hoc rationalization argument again, and trying to, to fit a, a square peg into a round hole. It just, you, come on, <laughs> let's, yeah. let's look a little bit more critically at these texts and, and and be intellectually honest with it. I'm loving this. I'm I'm loving hearing how you actually started cuz cuz this is the journey I can imagine in our minds. We don't give up everything all at once. It, it it's too difficult to go from like believer to unbeliever like completely. So what would happen Yeah, that makes your brain hurt. <laughs> yes, I can imagine that you felt the pressure here. So you probably started going, "Well, hold on. The, the Hebrew Bible does contradict the new, and there are many places you go into this in your book on the prophecies. But then did you start to think, well, maybe the Hebrew Bible's right. Judaism might have something to it because you're sh- so used to that milieu of, of believing in this God, right, that the Christians just came later and they're wrong and the earlier people might be right. So you started to entertain that, and did you find problems? I'm just asking. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Um, when I when I discarded the New Testament, I started watching your dear friend, Tobia Singer. Ah. And um, 
<laughs> I was addicted. I was absolutely addicted to his teachings. And, and that was very hard for me because I, I absolutely love the guy. I am. Yeah. Um, you can tell he's a real <laughs> sweetheart. He really is. <laughs> He's just amazing. I love, I just love listen. He's such calming. Um, yeah. But um, I was trying to figure out, okay, so my husband and I were both considering converting to Judaism and wrote him an email. And in such sweet fashion, he responded and he's like, welcome home. Right. And that I was just like, Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. I was so moved by that. And it was, it was painful to, to see this, this person who so sincerely believes in the old Testament. And for me to say, okay, well, I did this with the new Testament. I have to do this with the old Testament too. Mm -hmm. As much as I didn't want to, I needed to be intellectually honest with myself and do the homework on my own and prove all things true. And, yeah. you know, we are tested. There's several times in Deuteronomy where it says, you know, here's how you will know you need to do this. You need to do that. And if these things don't line up, then you have a problem. So yes, I had to, to go through the old Testament too. And for me, it was like, ah, <sighs> Okay, well, without this ad hoc rationalization, now we have new problems. Mm -hmm. We have inconsistencies and contradictions just here. You have places that say, you know, do this and that for sacrifices. And then other places that say, no, I never wanted sacrifices. And I'm like, what are we doing here? Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what where's the truth here now i don't understand and um and then you know critically looking at genesis was the biggest thing so that okay great let's go where your where your head's going here so genesis was it the creation yeah. myth and the whole genesis 1 to 11 or what was it in genesis cuz you seem to be interested in details that i never really took this this path it wasn't a path of me to go into sacrifice details and deuteronomy and like getting into what does the levitical law say about holiness and this like you're getting into those things whereas for me it was like this myth is definitely borrowing from or at least indirectly or directly using the mesopotamian mythology of the creation with the enuma elish and things like that like mm -hmm. that was my path Whereas it sounds like your path is different. So tell us your path. What, what was it in Genesis that got you thinking, huh? <laughs> well, while I'm looking at, at Genesis, I'm also, you know, finding, you know, I have friends who are, are on the same journey as I am at the same time. And they're going, oh, have you looked at this? Have you looked at that? Have you looked at this? And I'm, I'm finding out, you know, just little pieces here and there about the Enuma Elish and the Ek Epic of Gilgamesh and the Amenepony. I always say, I think I say that wrong. Anyway, it's okay. Um, I I'm looking at the, the 42, <laughs> the 42 laws of Ma'at and the, the Emerald Tablets of Thoth and the uh, Egyptian Book of the Dead. And I'm finding all these little pieces here and there that, that do that. Not so much with the Greek mythology, but more with the Egyptian right. uh, mythology. And as I'm doing that, um, I'm, I'm seeing that the, the Hebrew Bible has pulled from that as well. And, you know, I'm hearing a little bit about the Greek mythologies too, but that wasn't where I was researching. I was going into Genesis and not even the creation account. Because I understood the creation account didn't make sense. How do you have a day without the, the uh, bodies of light, right? Mm -hmm. You don't have a night and a day without the stars mm -hmm. and the sun and the moon. You don't have that. So while those are completely out of order and backwards, I'm going at, um, wait a minute. How is the original sin, original sin, if you don't have the knowledge of evil, which is sin? And I'm like, where is the, the, who is the guilty party really here? 
because you have this God who's supposed to be omnipotent and all knowing, you know, all everywhere, all the time, you know, all these yeah. things. And he's supposed to know the future and the past because he operates outside of time and space, you know, per some of these Christians. Well, okay. Then he had to have known that mankind would sin. And he had to have known that there would be a covenant. And then let's just beg the question here for a minute. Then you have this Jesus Messiah who comes later. Why wait? For one, why have such a flawed concept of the process from the beginning? Mm. You, he planted the tree right in the middle of newbies, told them, don't do this, right? And a lot of people are like, well, even kids know what no is. Okay, but do kids know what death is? Do kids know what sin is? No. So you're giving basically, it's like me opening up an Ikea box and the instructions are in German. I don't know German. Right. <laughs> so you're telling these people, don't do this or you're going to die. And then they don't. They don't die right away. They, you know, either immediately or eventually they don't die. Because you had to kick them out of the Garden of Eden so they don't live forever. So which yeah, is it? Like who's the guilty? Are they going to die or are they going to? You know, there's a problem with the whole thing straight yeah. from the beginning. And I'm, for me, I was just like, if the very beginning is wrong, how can I trust the rest of it? Yeah, this is a good point. So, so you bring up first of all, they wouldn't have known sin. Mm -hmm. if God did not have a tree there that they weren't supposed to touch. Okay. So this gets back to whole, like uh, when you talk like philosophy with people and they go, well, if God, they go, God created everything. And you go, well, who created God? Well, God always was. Okay. Almost like that is a must. There is no point. You should not question it. You should not doubt it. Well, I see no reason why we shouldn't question. Why did there have to be a tree there? Okay. This is why Calvinists actually go the full length and say, look, this is part of the plan. This was what God wanted. And then that's a whole different <laughs> pill to swallow, right? So now it's like, okay, sure. And that, that's where I went. I went that path eventually. Mm -hmm. At first, I was like wrestling with this. Like, I cannot imagine that God plants a, a tree, giving free will, doesn't want us to fall, yet mm -hmm. knows we're going to and still does it anyway. It's ridiculous. It's stupid. Well, and then curses mankind and curses women and creates this problem with m women are dirty and they're the worst of the worst. And they are the reason for mankind's fall. They are the reason they are the ones who test men and tempt men yeah. and women have to conform to X, Y, Z to that's make not sure just they Christianity. don't do that's in <laughs> Judaism. That is, yeah. That is, that is the patriarchal system of Abrahamic faith. That is something yeah. that is instilled in the whole thing. Even the rabbis with their prayers, yeah. God, I thank you that I was not born a woman. I mean, it's like, wow. Okay. Do you really want that? So yes, I'm with you 100%. And I love <laughs> rabbi. I love rabbi. I do. Uh, yeah. I don't agree with his worldview, but I tell you what, the guy does know his stuff when it comes to looking at the new Testament. So even oh, if you yeah. think he I starts, have books. <laughs> yeah, I got both of them over there and I have both of them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I love him to death. And maybe one day when I get to Israel, he'll take me on a tour guide, but I love the approach you're taking here because it sounds to me you were such a fundamentalist like I was, right? This mm -hmm. is good. I, I know that sounds bad for people who might be uh, not in the faith, but you got to understand the mind of someone like us. She stuck with the Bible. So like when I come up with a Numa leash or try to argue the book of dead or bring anything extra biblical, the person who's in this will yeah. not and cannot even consider that and says, I don't care. And even when they do, mm -hmm. they must have borrowed from the Bible. They must have borrowed from the Bible. They cannot imagine right, the Bible using right. that. So they don't even allow that to enter their mind. So how do you defeat these arguments for them? You use the Bible to defeat the Bible. That's the only right. way you can do it. And your book, Crucifying the Bible, is exactly that. It takes, yes. it's like, hey, okay, see this? 
that's in the Bible. Oh, see that? That's in the Bible. What do you do with that? You can't look right. at the problem. And you start to make them pay attention to these details. What really got me really interested, not too long ago, I was looking into this documentary hypothesis thing, Joel Baden. It's more technical, scholarly. But like he was like contradictions that are so obvious. Like, who's Moses' father-in-law? Or what mountain did they get the laws from? Is it Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai? The Hebrew Bible says both. They're not the same mountain, though. So, like, right. how do you get him getting commandments from two different mountains? You got to get this story right. Something's not <laughs> something's not adding up. You know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. Well, one of the ones that I came up with, I, and it just, it right before the book was published, it just hit me like a ton of bricks. So I was like, wait a minute. So, you know, you have this, this, this uh, restriction that God puts on David. No, you can't build the temple. And you can't build the temple because you shed blood. Got it. Mm -hmm. Wait a minute. Moses shed blood and he built the tabernacle. So what the heck? <laughs> yeah, it's kind of a, that's, it's, that's an interesting point you bring up. I always wondered about that. He wouldn't let him build it, but he did give all his riches to Solomon in order to build it. Um, and, and then Solomon being the wisest man turns into this lunatic alcoholic at the end with a thousand wives. I think it was like 700 concubines or 700 wives and 300 concubines. I can't remember. It's some number. It added up to a thousand, I think, or something like that. But Oh, yeah. And then there's one of the commandments that you're not supposed to have, like a whole crap ton of horses. And he does. <laughs> and you're like, okay. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, you're looking at details that I never yeah, really thought Yeah, a lot of about. details. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is this is the one who played Bible trivia as a child. So <laughs> And you always won, I'm sure. <laughs> no. No, my kidding. mom always won until we were older and then I and then I got her a couple of times. Yeah. Okay, let's see. We went to Judaism because now you realize Christianity didn't work. Now you realize there's problems with this to begin with. Uh, what happens from here now that you've been exploring, you even contacted rabbi and you were interested in Judaism and you did this examination. What, what happened once you saw these problems? Oh, uh, <laughs> um, so I was spiraling. Um, it's, it's a jarring paradigm shift to, to really have an identity crisis. Um, when you go from, I'm an ambassador for Christ, I'm a child of the most high king to, mm. wait, who am I? Uh, your, your brain hurts. And um, I, I had to get away. Uh, my husband didn't have the kind of problem um, that I did. Uh, he didn't have quite as strict of an upbringing. Um, but he was very heavy in the Hebrew roots movement with what same as me, you know, he was in uh, African countries wearing tzitzit. Mm. <laughs> so, you know, he's a, he's a, a consultant, uh, consultant uh, for projects overseas in Muslim countries wearing tzitzit. So he was pretty hardcore too. And, um, and, but he didn't have the problem coming out of it that I did. And I did. And I said, I need to get away. So I went to a mind and body retreat for a weekend. Um, and that was, that was really, really helpful for me. Um, and I came back and decided, okay, I'm just going to be Zen for a while. I'm just going to, you know, recenter myself. The, um, the anxiety and the panic was gone um, at that point after that weekend and it just allowed me to live. And so I just said, okay, I forget about, you know, all this identity, everything, every egg that was in that basket, let's just live one day at a time. Let's just step by step and figure it out. And so that's kind of what I did. I didn't have an expectation as to, well, who are you? I'm just like, I'm going to figure it out. I'm just going to yeah. figure it out. And so um, about a year and a half, I think, went by. And um, I hadn't thrown away the, 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 
Bibles, <laughs> the many Bibles that I had, the Strong's Concordance, the AENT, the Jewish Bible, the Chronological Bible, the, the you know, King James, the E. SV that I had, all of them. I kept them all, including the 1611 Bible, which was my favorite. And um, I started pulling them out um, after I had a, a single day that, that kind of changed my course and, and um, responding to a text that my sister had, trying to parallel Revelation to uh, the coronavirus pandemic and, and what was going on there. And so I started doing this response and, and said, Oh, I think I just started a book. And, and then I pulled it all out and said, here we go. Let's, I got something, I got something to say. <laughs> I know enough about this and I think it's needed. I think mm -hmm. it's definitely needed in, in the, um, in that market. Um, there are a lot of wonderful books out there that I'm finding out now. You know, when you're in your religion, you don't know what's out there because you're told not to look over there. Uh, so now I'm finding out all these wonderful authors and, and what's out there, your podcast and, and so many others who are doing amazing work. And I said, I think I have a space in there. Um, mm -hmm. So let's go. And my husband was on board. He said, you're going to, if we're going to do this, we're going all in. And I said, all right, let's do it. <laughs> yeah. You did a fantastic job of taking, like, I can imagine the fundamentalist like us wanting to really examine what you're saying and go into that. Because for someone who's like, not a believer who's like, let me read the documentary hypothesis. or they're just trying to like mm -hmm. get into highly critical stuff. Um, they even, I highly recommend read this because they would learn a, a lot of details. They probably never paid attention to on maybe why this is oil and that's water. They may not care as much like the, the Christians, the one who's going to go, no, it can't contradict. There can't be, there can't be problems. Well, read crucifying the Bible and you'll see, plenty of them. I mean, it's clear. And I've been saying this for a while. I had someone actually um, the other day comment. I won't say their name out of respect for them, but they commented on a video that I did with Bart that Bart only mentioned three contradictions, three of his favorite contradictions, Bart Ehrman, Dr. Ehrman. I, and, I uh, and, and in the comment section, um, you know, someone had to pop up and goes, I, I looked into these and these just don't seem like they're really contradictions. And I said, I responded, I said, I'm sure you'd say there aren't any contradictions anywhere in the Bible. And well, that's what my research has shown me so far, politely responding back to me. That's what my research has shown me so far. And I'm like, I'm thinking to myself, like, I know I used to say what you say. I know exactly right. why you're doing this. It's right. And it's so sad that I know psychologically exactly why you're doing that. And I'm going to tell you, you're absolutely full of it. You are absolutely full of it and you don't even know it and you, you right. may think that's rude of me to say but it's so clear to me it's like it frustrates me it's like the the drug addict and i have to use myself as an example i went through drug addiction and i hear the drug addict making up the excuses for why they yeah. won't go to rehab or why they can't get clean today or whatever i said all of those things thousands of times before i finally committed and yep. got clean the same thing comes with this. Oh, no, I've never. My research has let. Well, you have not been researching. You do not know what you're talking about. That's it. Bottom line. I have Christian scholars who come on my channel who say there are contradictions in the Bible. Point blank. These people have not hit the enlightenment. This is what they say. These Christians that you're talking to that say there are no contradictions have not hit the, the point of enlightenment. They're, they're 400 years in the past. They don't even know what they're talking about. Now, when you have Christians saying that on your channel about other Christians, I think it's time Christians wake up. I think it's time that they consider it. Now, for whatever reason, these Christians still believe they still have their, their ontological position in Christianity or uh, someone who might claim to be a Jew, right? There's I have friends online who still claim Judaism as their practice and whatnot, but they're they're open to the contradictions and the problems and the documentary hypothesis and all that, but they still believe in the God of the Bible. And I'm like, I guess. Okay. I'm not 
you know, whatever. Just for me, I don't that I cannot see why I, once I discovered all this, would want to believe in that anymore. How do you feel about that? Uh, there's such an emotional attachment. I mean, psychologically, when you have such an emotional attachment to anything, um, it's hard to get past that uh, cognitive dissonance. And like me, I, you know, when I was in it, I was fighting for misogyny. I was fighting for the arguing for the genocide that God had commanded. You know, mm. that was right. It had to be right because God commanded it. That's not an excuse, but um, I was fighting for um, the land theft and the uh, destruction of in infants. And I, I was arguing for those contradictions. And it would, you know, when you're when you're in it and you don't question it, I can see why there's such a problem with people who make those type of comments and no they're not doing their research they're not looking at it i had my blinders on well especially with the um and i have a, a chapter in it uh called the bisexual king i would not look <laughs> at the relationship and those scriptures talking about david and jonathan i would not read anything about it because I didn't want to know. I didn't want there to be that in the, the pedigree of, of Jesus. Right. I, it was, it was, for, that was blasphemy to me, but it is there. And when, <laughs> when you can finally have that honest um, conversation with yourself and, and others and be an honest interlocutor, you can finally see the, mm the problems and the contradictions, but it is painful psychologically for people. And so, yeah, they, I don't think they look, I don't think they want to look until they're yeah, ready. That's the point. It, they really don't. They want to find ways to solve it. They want to find ways to keep it at all costs, even mm -hmm. if it's dishonest, they assume it's honest because they start with the Bible is true. So, if you start with your conclusion is that the Bible is true, then anything that's contrary to that can't be true. So I have to flex and rubber band stretch and do whatever I have to do to make the Bible be true because, well, we started with this thing is true. If it's yeah. already, it's true. Then all of your contradictions that you point out in this book. And I mean, there are hundreds of issues, every one of them, they will somehow find a way to mm -hmm. make it work. And it's point blank obvious that it doesn't, but when you believe you do what you got to do. So you brought up the bisexual King, I guess it'd be a hot topic to end on to leave people with a cliffhanger because I really want to have you come back and let's get into more details that we didn't discuss that are in your book and yeah. everybody better go get that book. I mean, it's, it's <laughs> a must get, especially if you're like me and you're driving, get audi audible. Um, Cause I know that you'll be able to listen to it and, and get through it. And it's not too long on audible so you can actually get through it. it's not too long to get through um and i have a to... i have a promo code for audible too so uh Ooh. that's on my uh facebook page so check it out so you get the discount Ooh, yeah. awesome awesome so go to the facebook i'll put that down in the description for everybody uh so they can go and and follow you and get the book What's up with the bisexual king? I mean, is this something I've never really dug into this myself, but I have seen you post on it recently <laughs> and it's probably going to get a lot of people angry. That oh, are sure. Christian, of course. Um, I know that John, Dave, I know that David loved Jonathan and it says pretty clearly, if I'm not mistaken, more than any woman that he's ever mm -hmm. known. Sure. Um, what have you found research wise and have you had like any backup? on this from others that have said like, yes, this seems to imply more than just the really best buds. Well, there's so much more than just that one comment. Cause that was, that was several chapters after the initial um, covenant. Like they make a covenant with each other. Right. So D David and Jonathan make a covenant with each other. Then they strip and, you know, he removes his 
sword and his bow and his girdle and they kiss and they uh, Jonathan hides David and so all this time um, Saul is angry you know he's been trying to kill David so why does he give David his daughter as a wife if nothing else than to separate David from Jonathan. But then David abandons that wife to get away from King Saul, who then chases him for nine years. Right? And he goes to the, to the town of Nob, where uh, priests had hid David, and he calls the Levitical priests Benjamites. Well, that's really interesting. Why would you call Levitical priests Benjamites? Right. Oh, wait Different a minute. Time. The entire tribe of the Benjamin was almost completely wiped out for their homosexuality and support of it. What? <laughs> so... Hold on. <laughs> oh, yeah. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I didn't know that. Um, so this is clearly yeah. something that I, I remember. Clearly, I remember watching and, a like video, old Bible video, where they pulled out bows in the temple and they shot the Levitical priest. They like literally kill them in the court mm -hmm. right there in front of King Saul. So that was that image. Then technically, they just obviously didn't tell you. Oh, by the way. These guys support LGBTQ. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like these guys right, are, right. are pro-homosexual. So, yeah, he calls all the Levitical priests, you Benjamites. That doesn't make any sense. They're Levitical priests. They're not of the tribe of Benjamin, right? right. Uh, but then, you know, then there's this one outburst that, you know, started me, my whole journey on this. It says, you son of the perverse, rebellious woman. Do you think that I do not know you have chosen the son of Jesse to your own confusion and unto the confusion of your mother's nakedness? Why would you say that to somebody if it was just a friendship? You're going to bring about women and their nakedness if it's just about a friendship? Saul knew. He absolutely knew that his son and David were having an, a relationship, a very intimate relationship. There's more in that chapter that goes yeah. into it in more detail, but I think that should say enough right there. Yeah, to, you definitely. Know, kinda... <laughs> you got to get the book. <laughs> uh, you know, it may, there's a lot of questions that come up and this gets into like uh, one of the scholars that I have interviewed. When you look in Deuteronomy, uh, and I'm totally bad. Eden Dershowitz, uh, Professor Eden Dershowitz, I've had him on and he thinks and I, I might be butchering this. So don't take it to the bank. You got to go to him. So don't don't take it out on me if I'm mistaken here. But I did an interview on on the whole homosexual laws in Deuteronomy. Mm -hmm. And he thinks that. Originally, it seems that these were not about same sex. These were about incest. And this was about like, do not sleep with your mother or your father or like things like that. And then it became like pro, like absolutely no male with male, you know, that kind of stuff. So I wonder, and especially when we look at like Josiah, right? We have, and he rediscovers the law, things like that. Uh, really, did he rediscover it or did they then in create the law? There's different questions of when these laws come on the scene and when they're developed. But I wonder if these implications by David and what happened with Jonathan, David, and potentially Saul, if there is a kernel of historical truth to it, don't know, big question mark. If there right. is, did that play any impact on the development of the law? And I wonder if it did. I don't know. It's just, just throwing it out there. Like it's, it's something to think about. Right. <laughs> so it, but the big thing for me is like, it just puts kind of a, a different um, spin on the whole Bible, the whole narrative. And, you know, 
now we see, and it, for me, it's, it's actually a beautiful story. It's very painful. Um, when you read the, the whole thing in context, you know, all those chapters that encompass the story, um, it's such a tragic um, love story between the two. And then to see how much he grieved for Jonathan when he found out and, you know, what he said in that grief is, is beautiful and it's so poetic too, but you find this is, this is the pedigree of, of Jesus. And to me, it's just, it was important to put it in the book because there's so much bigotry. There's so much hatred. There's so much uh, intolerance of, of same sex couples. And if they're two adults and they're consenting no one should be saying anything. And yeah, now don't, Christians don't even have an excuse. <laughs> now that's a good point. Don't be like King Saul, right? Uh, a, a, a man's man who wanted to try and straighten the issue out and get him to do what he wanted. So his firstborn would be the king and whatnot. Yeah. Yeah. There's a big, this is, gosh, you, you should write Netflix. Like there should be a, a whole series of game of Thrones just based off the Bible. I said the same thing about <laughs> Islam too. Like if you get into Islam and I'm not saying for those same reasons, but like, Oh my gosh, I listened to this book by Leslie Hazleton and it's called after the prophet. And he mm. goes into like his marriages with his wives and his favorite wife. And, and like once he died, what happened and the fighting over who would be the caliph and like the, the civil wars and the bloodbath of family members killing each other and the things that happen. It is Game of Thrones. I'm not kidding you. So I don't know why someone's not writing it other than the <laughs> fact that they don't want to get killed, uh, you know, for, for Islam, you know. So, But the Bible right. should be touched. There's people who are allowing this and I think all of it should be. But the point is, is we could do that and they wouldn't probably – get like turned off or anything i i don't see why king david couldn't be that would be amazing to go into that story i don't know yeah the, the whole i actually said that in the end of the book i said you know the bible is incredibly full of so much action and drama and romance and comedy and uh you name it it's all there Mm -hmm. sci-fi even i mean we have teleportation in the bible <laughs> for goodness sakes yeah in the book of acts there's teleportation there's so Doesn't much there. elijah get like teleported to a whole different location as well or something at some point right so i think it, it's philip that it, it literally says he you know came up out of the water and philip was transported to uh, yeah. uh i forgot the name of the town starts with an a um Azotus, I think. Anyway, um, but you have all of this, and it should be just utilized for entertainment purposes only, and, and not just that. But there should be a, a like a cigarette style warning on on the Bible that says rated R. You can't peel that off or something. Right. Uh, do not do not this to be at taken home. literally. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right, right. So this is not to be taken literally. Objects in the mirror are closer than they appear. You know, things like that. Just... <laughs> oh, that is great. That is so good. Wow. Yeah. Look, ladies and gentlemen, I can't tell you enough. Let me go ahead and pop it up for everybody to see again. Get the book, Crucifying the Bible. I know it's really small. Let me let me fix that. Crucifying the Bible. Gotta get it. Um audibles here the audiobook paperback you can get it on kindle there are many ways to do it go to her facebook uh page right now go get the little code get the hookup and go read this book uh you, you're gonna fall in love we've got so much more to get into deborah uh that we haven't even touched on but but we definitely touched on a big one there with david i think that's a huge uh That'll interest people, I think, to really want to check out what you say on the topic. And you support it with the Bible. Like you actually are yep. showing this is what it says. Yeah, all the references are there. All the scripture references are in the tables. So, you know, fact check me. Yeah. Mm. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I hope you go do that. Deborah, thank you for your time. Any final words? Um, Merry Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> right yeah we still uh enjoy these holidays you know there's 
we don't have to believe in order to have an enjoyment of seasons and things and stuff. So um, someone out there struggling, they're doubting and they're looking at, you know, where do I go from here and how do I know what I'm saying, what I'm looking at is true or not. And they're looking at your book. What would you say to that person? Um, there was a, a proverb that my mom lived by and it was actually her words that, um, allowed me to write this book. And, and she says, you know, you, if something in the Bible doesn't line up to what you think and believe in, in your mind, you're the one that has to adjust. You cannot twist the data. And it was very similar to the Russian proverb, uh, that you, you know, I'd rather be slapped with the truth than kissed with a lie. And I, you know, it takes courage to look at your faith critically. Um, but if you do that, you're a badass. And m I applaud you for that. Absolutely. Ladies and gentlemen, if you are out there and that's you and you're that badass, feel free to join us in the chant. We are Mythvision.